Uh, you said that you, yeah, the, we are recording this for those students who cannot attend in, in person right now, but those who are here, you have it live and right now and can ask questions. Uh, no, thanks a lot. Those who are not speaking, perhaps mute, so I don't have any echo. Uh, and, and yes, maybe you mentioned this 71. I think, um, yeah, the very latest is actually 81. I just had my haircut in Barbados. <laughs> that was haircut country number 81. Um, but but uh, anyhow, it's, uh, it's, it has to do with, with the topic you are studying. In order to export a service, like you cut a hair of somebody, you have to import goods. So my empirical study is about gut and guts and how you have to import shampoos and machines and scissors to export a service. And then you find, uh, and, and I will soon start with the maritime transport, but uh, these things come often in container. But in the poorest countries, you often find that the hairdresser is local and the staff to cut and shampoo is import. In the bigger and richer countries, you often have the nationally used, produced scissor shampoo, but the hairdresser are often guest workers. And the most exotic countries, like when I had my haircut on the Marshall Islands, both were imports. So that's also part of the trade economics. Let me start with sharing the screen. Uh, we tested it before it did work, so we hope it will still work right now. And you should be seeing my office right now. So if anything does not work, you will interrupt me, let me know. So there, there the building in the middle is, is my office where we produce the review of maritime transport. Switzerland is a landlocked country, but we do have our lake and our little boats. And I am member of the Propeller Club of the Port of Geneva. Uh, there are a lot of organizations in Geneva that deal with trade, with shipping. The WTO is here, UNCTAD. Uh, ILO is important, World Health Organization, UNC Fact, ISO, the biggest shipping company in the world, MSC, is, is based on this side of the lake where I'm, where I'm taking the photo. So quite a lot of things happening here. On the personal side, um, yes, uh, William, you mentioned also that part of the story. It's actually past tense. My family sold the ship quite some time ago, but here you have our entire fleet. That was the fleet of Hoffman shipping. So that's the true case to illustrate how globalized shipping is. So the owner was my father. He was German. The flag we used was Antigua and Barbuda. Our freight agent was in Amsterdam. Seafarers were Polish. The crewing agent Navigo management in Cyprus. We would move cargo, for example, from Turkey to Canada, get fuel in Algeciras, had an insurance short in a p and club in, in the UK, repaired in a shipyard in Portugal. So if this was where now in person, I would make it interactive and ask you, I could, but that's like how many countries are involved or were involved in Hoffman shipping. Yes, you're right. It was 11 countries because captain's favorite drink was from Ireland. So that's the one thing you will remember still in 10 years from now. You will forget all the numbers and demand and supply curves that I will also explain to you. But the globalized production of shipping is here illustrated with Hoffman shipping. What do we do in Anktat? So that was a bit of personal now. Anktat, we like to say we think, we debate, we deliver, uh, we produce research. We, we, the original Anktat, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, well, it was a conference, 1964. We will soon have our 60th anniversary. So, and after the conference, then the secretariat of the conference was asked to also produce research, to think, and afterwards also to help implement the outcomes of the conference. So in terms of research, I will today mostly speak about our review of my time transport. We also have a line of shipping connectivity index. We have online statistics, country profiles, a lot of information in the maritime part, which then helps our own UNCTAD um, uh, um, meetings, but also regional. And right now we work closely with the IMO. So the IMO is negotiating uh, future measures to decarbonize shipping and UNCTAD supports this process through our research about potential impacts. So if there's a, a levy or some technical measure and freight costs go up, what does this mean for trade costs, for trade and for GDP? You know? And then we have technical assistance 
uh, on yeah, it's, we are not like the World Bank. We don't we don't build bridges or ports or, or roads. We we do the soft part. We do above all uh, training, advisory services, what we call capacity building. So let me go to the review of my time transport. Oh well, no, not yet. Let me go a step before and tell you the story so far, a bit of a long-term trend, like imagine a James Bond movie where before the movie actually starts, we have to go through 15 minutes of, of what happened before and then finally the movie starts. So that's where we are right now. The story so far, yeah. Um, this is what I show you here's a global trend to the data here is for the United States within logistics expenditure in the United States in 1980, there would be more expenditure on inventory holding than on transport. Then thanks to you, thanks to the industry, thanks to better trade station, better ports, better digitalization, the inventory holding goes down. We no longer need to keep so much stuff and pay for warehousing, insurance, depreciation, and so on. But instead, we pay for things to move. So today, uh, there's twice as much expenditure on transport than on inventory holding. Another positive trend, I, I think I call it positive in the sense we have more and more globalization. The typical ton of cargo travels a longer distance, there's overall increasing trend. So iron ore from Brazil goes more to China than to Europe, uh, LNG from Trinidad to Japan, not only to the US, and so more global. These are all commodities together. Uh, a third positive trend, uh, some of you are perhaps old enough and learned this picture at school. So loaded are the exports, unloaded the imports. That's hard data, hard port data. So the share of developing countries used to be a big trade surplus. Do you remember? Would you agree? Well, remember, it says tons. So if Brazil exports iron ore and, and Argentina exports uh, grain and Saudi Arabia exports oil and, and, so, and South Africa coal, this is high volume, but low value. And they imported manufactured goods from the US, from Europe, from Japan. Today, totally different picture, totally different geography of trade. The so-called developing countries, including China, Korea, Singapore. No, you remember, they were developing countries. But it's not happening everywhere, but it's a trend that happens everywhere. Developing countries participate in globalized production and also import more raw materials and then produce manufactured goods. And then came COVID. What happened during COVID? Uh, freight rates multiplied by five, charter rates for container ships by nine. And here comes the best explanation you will see what happened during COVID. Microeconomics, shipping economics 101. The demand is very inelastic. Uh, I could have drawn this blue line even steeper, actually. You need a big change in the freight rate to have a small change in volume because you really need that iPhone for Christmas. You really need the fuel to, to fuel your car in Fiji. You really need that spare part to continue production in Germany. And no matter what is the price of transport, you need it because transport is a small part of the final price. On the supply side, this is a bit different from what we learn in normal microeconomics 101. As long as we have spare capacity, prices don't change and companies lose money. <laughs> the moment you reach a capacity limit, the supply curve goes very steep. For many years, we had freight rate around A. And then came COVID, and I bought a bigger screen for my computer. My wife bought a, a thing to, to do bicycle at home, and everybody ordered things online. They were often made in China and Vietnam and Thailand. They came in the container. The demand moves to the right. What happened to the supply curve? Ships spent 20% longer in port than before on average, that reduced capacity, it went to the left. 
and freight rates went up. What did this mean for the long-term trends? It meant that for the first time, we actually had an impact on prices. This simulation we did two and a half years ago when Paul Krugman was still saying, don't worry about inflation. And we said, hmm, we think there will be an impact on the world prices. Not all of you may know all these funny acronyms that the United Nations speak for LLDC. These are the landlocked developing countries. They trade less by maritime. They were less affected. But the SITs, the small island developing states, they were really screwed. Uh, sorry, they were really negatively affected. Yeah? So their prices went up 7.5. And this is an average. So for, for many families, we really had more poverty. If you already earn very, very little and you have to buy all your food and, and your real income goes down by 7, 10, sometimes 20%, it really had a very bad effect on poorer societies. Which products were mostly affected? And, and this I find particularly interesting. So the average, you remember I said 1.5% price increases. <laughs> there you have the item furniture, other manufacturing. These are, imagine small, uh, the, these plastic garden furniture, plastic chairs, very cheap. You have a container full of plastic furniture where the content of the container may be $20,000 or even less. And if then the freight rate goes up from five to 25,000 or depending on the route, yeah, it has an impact on the price. That's easy. The top one there, you see, is computer, electronics, optical products. There you wonder, that's strange. If the uh, value of the goods inside the container is half a million, a million dollar, why does it make a difference if the freight rate goes up? Well, before you put that Nikon camera into the computer, into the, sorry, <laughs> into, the, into the container, the chip, the plastic bag, the, the components, the lens, the part, they have been moved and moved and moved and their supply chains up to nine times deep, deep supply chains, and that accumulates, it moves up. It, it adds on, it adds up. So that is why, although maybe the average impact on prices is one and a half percent, if you have it several times, the prices go up a lot. So I, this was what happened during COVID. And now we are back, updated just for you this weekend, latest freight rates, latest charter rates. You, you know, the, the red line is what you and I pay for a container and that when fivefold and now it's back, almost back where it was before. The blue line is what the MERSC, the, the MSCs, the CMR, CVM, the Costco, the Hapagloids of this world, what they pay to charter the, the container ship. And that had gone up even more. But it's both now, now back. So what happened to my long-term trends? Actually, during COVID, in the United States, the share of expenditure on inventory holding went up even more than the share of expenditure on transport. Remember, transport prices went up a lot, but because of the chaos and the bad, man I mean, all the problems of, of risk and inventory holding on things in the wrong places, the share of expenditure and inventory holding went up even more. That's bad news. We do think uh, that thanks to improved digitalization, a lot of improvements also during COVID with investment and in trade facilitation solutions, uh, modernization. We do think that in the long term, we will go back to the previous trajectory. What about the distance? Here too, during COVID, all of a sudden, maybe there was a little more nearshoring, but it's not a major change. Anyhow, the, and I'll come back to this, now the distance has continued to go up. The share of developing countries, for the first time since we look at this, since 1970, it slightly decreased because of the lockdown in China and because of the surge demand. Thank you for printing money, Mrs. Lagarde and, and Mr. Biden and the central banks. The latest, again, it's back to the 
I would call positive trajectory. And, and one other chart by way of example, which I, I think shows nicely where in many aspects, so that's United Kingdom, but it seems, it seems that we are back to the previous trajectory in many of the economic and transport and logistics trend, which then now allows me to end my little uh, precursor James Bond uh, movie and start with the presentation of the review of my time, Transport 2023. And I've put it into four blocks. The first one is the energy transition. It's the biggest change impact for our industry. Um, and let me start out really highlighting how, how important this is. The previous energy transitions in shipping, in yeah, maritime transport, were self-funded because the new technology was more cost efficient than the previous one. When you move from rowing to sail, you move from sail to coal and steam, you move from coal and steam to oil, it was always an improvement. And now the new alternative fuels, they are uh, like up to four times less energy dense, uh, like you need up to four times more volume to transport the same energy. They are more costly, they are you need to some of them you need to cool down, others are dangerous. So you might think it's, it's bad. Yes. And still, I would argue, if we include all the costs in the decision of the of the ship owner or the operator, whoever decides what fuel to use and what ship to build, it would still be self-funding because CO2 emissions have a negative externality. We already have a cost of climate change. So a main point when people say, oh, but it's too costly, say, well, already today, somebody else is paying for climate change. That will be my a key point because I come back to this at the end with the challenge of opportunities. So let me start with the energy transition, something about markets and then about ports and then a bit look into the future. But I will come back to the energy transition a couple of times. This chart here um, is the one actually most quoted, used, referred to in the international press when we launched our review. Um, emissions are supposed to go down and they increased by 20% during the last 10 years. So that's the bad news. Total emissions from shipping continued to go up. Positive news, if you do this per ton mile, it's actually going down because ship's efficiency has improved. It's not yet the use of alternative fuels. It is really more, a, little, a lot of these little up and down between quarters or these monthly annualized is, um, a lot of this is, um, is changes in speed, but the overall positive trend is, yeah, improved technologies, port core optimization and so on. No? Now, I started with bad news, good news. Now comes back to the not so good news. Half of the improvement that you saw in the previous one. So half of this is economies of scale. If you look on the left, you see the emission, the so-called emission intensity of a feeder ship is four times more than the biggest. Now, I, this is being recorded, so I won't be quoted wrongly. It is recorded that I'm saying we are not a fan of big ships. <laughs> there are many disadvantages of the ever bigger ship sizes for total logistics costs, for market concentration. Yeah, But in terms of the emissions, half of the improvement was thanks to ever bigger, especially container ships. Let's, we'll come back to this a bit in the challenges part, but uh, let's some, some data on demand, supply, markets, introduction. What is it that is actually being moved? Um, here, yeah, in order to include containers, we start in 2003. When I 
look uh, very long ago we started we have some data since 1960s yeah oil used to be more than half of seaborne trade volume huh? but what has been growing is really the dry bulk the the iron ore the coal the grain huh? um, and containers has been growing compared especially to other dry to the general cargo so that's a bit big trends and a lot of this underlying raw data you can download it's on our website uh, statistics so if you want to work with it do your own charts or trends or something now if i put all this together and look at annual changes um, you have here the tons and the ton miles looks very similar you have the decline during the financial crisis you had the decline at the beginning of, of covid um, what is more interesting here is that in most years, the ton miles are increasing a little more than the tons. And that means that the average distance, which you remember I showed you before, has been going up. So here, uh, coming back to the average distance here by different commodities, when, when I first did this chart and wrote the text, I wrote, we have reached historical high distances in the um, bulk commodities. And some of my colleagues who are a bit more critical, a bit more careful than I am, they said, Jan, we don't know because we only have data since 1980, more or less. And maybe in the 1970s or maybe in the, fifth, in the 16th century, who knows if the distance was, was longer. Yeah, But for the data we have, we have never had such, such high distances. And it keeps going up grain that Egypt used to buy from Ukraine is now they have to buy in the US or Brazil. Oil that used to go from Russia to Europe is now going to India and China. And this all this adds to the distances. The one that did not go up is container. So the container, the red line, is the only one that has been going down because we have more and more intra-Asian trade. So if you have more and more global regional value chains within Vietnam, Korea, China, and so on. There, because the share of container trade intra-Asia is going up, the average distance is going down. Um, that's a bit on the demand side. Now on the supply side, I have, I've redone a chart. We have in the review to get the message even clearer. In, in the review, we have absolute numbers. Here I have, um, just for you, <laughs> world tonnage and order in percent of the existing fleet. And there you really see how low the order book is. And this is worrying. You remember how I showed you during the supply chain crisis, the supply went to the left and freight rates went up. As we speak, ship owners are waiting. They are worried. They do not know um, the future, the political and war and problems and risk. Risk is poison for uh, investment. Interest rates are high. Uh, but one aspect of the, this uncertainty is, of course, the energy transition. What ship should I buy? For what fuel? If, if I don't know the future technology and I do not know what will be the agreement at the International Maritime Organization about a levy on carbon, when will it start? Will it start? How much will it be? Will there, what will be the obligations? By when do I really have to decarbonize? How is it enforced? So in the meantime, ship owners wait. Ships, the average age of the world fleet is very low, and not historically low, but, but very low compared to decades. So this is very worrying especially as we have learned during the COVID crisis that a lack of supply can really lead to very high freight rates. Let's move to the ports and maritime connectivity. Um, again, some shipping data gives us some data about the, the ports, the time in port. Um, I think it's interesting for those who are maybe not that be that familiar, it nicely shows the typical dry bulk ship always spends much longer in port <clears throat> because the 
uh, yeah, it's the way, especially for, for unloading, dry bulk, it, it takes time. The, the, the goods are not that high value, so it doesn't matter so much. No. Um, then the come general cargo, liquid bulk, and the fastest are the containers, because they're also, when a container ship goes to a port, it does not load and unload all its cargo, so that it's quicker, it spends less time in port. The, the, the whole beauty of the container is that it facilitates quick loading, unloading. What we do see here, um, I mean, unfortunately, this one only starts in 2018, because before that, was not that much AIS data, but actually the very long-term trend was an improvement. Over the decades, the time in port was going down. And during COVID, you see that's actually quite significant when you see the increase from, from 0.7 to 0.85 for container ships. That's what I mentioned earlier, the 20% the longer in port. So let's focus a bit more on the on the container shipping. Ah, here, why, why did I put this? Maybe, yeah, the, that's also the ship on the cover of our review of maritime transport. That's a photo I took standing on this crane in the port of Jeddah. So when you download the review of maritime transport, that's a photo I took from this crane. And, and now we look to some trends in container shipping. Two sides of the same coin. And, and Lourdes will remember this um, from for years, we have looked at the shipping connectivity, the fleet deployment, and we always said there are two sides of the same coin. Ships get bigger, that's the blue line, and companies get fewer. Ship sizes grew faster than the volume of container rest rate increased. So mathematically, something has to give. Some companies have to leave a specific service. Some Hanjins have to go bankrupt. Some um, Hamburg suits have to be sold and so on. Now, interestingly, if you now look since already 2019, and, and this is for the natural experiment in, in history, it's unfortunate <laughs> because we have COVID, but we also had coincidentally already just before COVID, that the ship sizes no longer increased. The, and, and we don't know, maybe we can discuss, uh, maybe if people have other views, opinion. I would say the, the container ships will not get significantly bigger than today. There are some container ships on the drawing board that have up to 28,000 TEU, uh, but they are not really bigger. They are not longer or wider or deeper. This is more how it's built. Because today's container ships are roughly as big as the biggest oil tankers that ever exist in the biggest dry belt carriers. So the shipyards, the canals, the ports, the insurance, the whole system may have reached a maximum. And if you look at the orange line, actually, this is now more has to do with COVID, with all these profits that were made, other carriers were entering some other markets. Uh, most of this growth, actually, this little increase of the orange line towards the end is in Asia. So, well, could be a long discussion, but I find this a very interesting graph, which invites to a lot of discussion. Uh, and out of this, we generate our indices and so on. So we have some some averages here, as I mentioned, the increase in the number of operators, the level of competition has been going down in all regions uh, and recently increased, especially in, in Asia. The number of container ports included in the system, it's a bit part of the same story. Again, Asia is the one where it has been increasing. In Europe, look how it has actually been decreasing over the last, what is it, the last five years, no? Um, so some hard data, each one of them, if you take notes, have questions, you will you ask me later, but I, I find this interesting. <laughs> uh, the, the World Bank together with uh, Standard & Poor developed this, this container port performance index. Another topic we could discuss, uh, some people don't like it at all because their ports don't look too good. Um, 
North American ports do not look good under this system, uh, which may have to do with underinvestment infrastructure, may have to do with labor unions not working 24 seven, but it also has to do with the fact that the United States is mostly big containers. Here we look at calls, it's import containers, not transshipment, and this simply tends to take a little longer. So a lot of things can be interpreted here. I'm presenting this from the review. Um, on that date of, of time in port, one step back, now again, not by region, but just two regions, very simplified. The developing countries, on average, tend to be less uh, efficient. And in the long term, some, somebody does not have his or her microphone uh, muted. I think this must be Guadalupe. If you mute yourself, then I don't hear your typing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, so you see the blue line is um, is higher than the orange line, meaning in developing countries, ports on average are worse, except during COVID, where the surge in demand, this printing money, the stimulus packages and so on led to this more congestion. So during COVID, actually on a couple of occasions, the developed countries' ports were worse than the average developing country. So what can we do to improve? Um, and you are all fully aware that um, all those people who confuse correlation and causality, they will all eventually die. At the same time, maybe there is some causality here. <laughs> maybe some trade facilitation measures really help to speed up port processes. So we looked at correlation between specific trade facilitation measures and found that these four here that are within articles of the WTO trade facilitation agreement, electronic payment, risk management, authorized operators and border agency cooperation, those countries that have implemented the measure have in the statistical distribution on average, a better country container port performance index. Is that causality or is there a common causality to both? It's, but it makes sense. I mean, we think there's some logic that these measures help improve port performance. So what happened with these reforms, these port performance, these, um, or these trade facilitation? There were, are two key developments. During the supply chain crisis, we saw a lot of demand for improvements. At UNCTAD, I mentioned earlier, we have these technical assistance, we have a customs automation program, we have technical information, uh, sorry, trade information portals, we have, um, single windows, we have a lot of working, building up capacity and all this transit information exchange, all this received a surge in demand during the supply chain crisis. That's, I would call it on the demand side. And on the supply side, we have this exponential technological progress in artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I love that, I find it fascinating. Uh, I have to very proudly say that one of my three sons did a master's in AI in England and well, amazing. <laughs> um, so the, the story here with digitalization, with these modernization, the, one way to look at it is there are stages, optimization, extension, and transformation. Optimization, for example, can be a port call optimization like instead of going fast and and then arrive early and enjoy the port, which is what Captain Hoffman and Hoffman Shipping did. Uh, we had our own little Volkswagen Golf on the ship and my father, who was the captain, he would go as fast as possible, because then he could unload his own Golf and drive around. And as he was also the captain, he was also entitled to decide that for the navigation and safety reasons, he had to go so fast. Nowadays, of course, it's the shipper as for as this type of cargo that pays the fuel and, and the shipper prefers port call optimization. <laughs> um, then there are a lot of 
extend new business opportunities. This is actually from a seminar of the Global Maritime Forum in Hamburg, which was really interesting. Look at all these new businesses. And then comes the transformation. And I am proud to say this slide, I first started building up in 2018. That's now five years ago, when we did not have ChatGPT as yet. And not all the books I put there I had read at that time, but I, I think I was on the right track, <laughs> having read most of these books and thinking, I, it's getting serious with AI, and it is getting serious. No? So for you, a lot of research, thinking, in-depth work here. Uh, what is the impact of artificial intelligence on the future of international transport and logistics? So seven areas I'm condensing here, like a lot of thinking and work we, we have done. Uh, seven key areas summarized for you. Optimization. AI algorithms can analyze massive amounts of data to find the most efficient routes and so on and so forth. Quicker, more cost-effective deliveries, reducing overall emissions, number one. Number two. Autonomous vehicles and drones, self-driving drugs, which have fewer accidents. Huh? All photos are from Hoffman's travels, by the way. This one almost killed me in Guatemala. Um, so that improves also safety, number two. Number three, demand forecasting. Uh, this thing I showed you with less expenditure on inventory holding, this definitely helps. Reduce stockouts, overstocks, and so on. Number four. Customs clearance, the whole um, issue of, of uh, single windows, automated, there are many things that can be facilitated with AI. Number five, smart ports, smart warehouses, robotic systems, automation in, in there. No? Um, number six, um, visibility, um, transparency, I, I love that. That guy, he has all the overview of, of his cables in Vietnam. But it, it prevents delays, improves customer satisfaction. And last but not least, enhanced security. AI can analyze patterns, detect potential threats, and yeah, take the, you can take preventive measures. Did you believe everything I told you? Good. You should. Because who told me all this? It's ChatGTP. Sorry. I cheated. AI can also help me prepare my PowerPoints. So here you have the, the text. I asked the question to my ChatGPT version 4, where I pay my $20 or so per month. And it gave me these answers. The all I did was add my photos to entertain you. Impressive, no? Bon. Technological progress. Oh, sorry, that was for the people in Hamburg. Der technologische Fortschritt wird nie so langsam sein wie heute. No, el progreso tecnológico nunca será tan lento como hoy. Technological progress will never be as slow as today. Uh, is it slow? No, it's not slow. It's fast. It's going to be even faster. Who leads the IT reforms in your company, your port, your logistics company? The CEO, tech, no, it was COVID-19, of course, that led to all these reforms. Um, here in, in Geneva, you know, we have MSC. There was a conference here in person. Uh, Andre Simha from Mediterranean Shipping Company, he presented the e-bill of lading. And I asked him a sincere, honest question. It was not a rhetorical question, uh, whether this e-bill of lading, which we have been talking about for the last 30 years, would have happened without COVID? And the answer was no. It is thanks to COVID that the breakthrough has come. So when COVID started, we built, we called it a 10-point action plan, a bit of a policy brief, going from the ship to the port, leaving the port transit, and so on. One key point, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, the text it, it is, the question is, is there a trade-off between uh, controls and the, the task of customs and trade station? No, the balance is the wrong picture. There's not a single measure in the WTO agreement, in the World Customs Organization recommendation, in the UN CFAC standards, in the UNCTAD programs, 
nothing says you should not control. All the measures that we promote from collaboration between agencies to risk management, to pre-arrival processing, to more transparency, to digital. I mean, there are many, many, many things that achieve both. No, they help facilitate transparent trade and protect the population from whatever you want to protect them from. That's really important. I think for you, it's probably not that surprising, but when I speak to customs officers or brokers who live on the inefficiencies of others, they sometimes, and I'm not, I'm sometimes not sure, is it a pretext or do they really believe it? But it's not correct to say that the trade facilitation measures impose additional risks, but on the contrary, they help achieve both. So the negotiation, ratification, implementation of, of conventions takes time. We need to commit to whatever is the best future technological solution. So for example, in the WTO agreement, there's something that says uh, you should, uh, customs should accept copies instead of originals, insist, not insist on originals. Well, what is the copy? What is the original if you transmit data? I think this is already a bit outdated. Um, so some of you may have a favorite football club, like my brother Björn in Hamburg is HSV fan. Uh, others have favorite musicians or favorite food. I have a favorite article in the TFA. Article 10.1. Yeah, Article 10.1. That's the best. <laughs> in the long term, Article 10.1 is the only one that will still be relevant in 100 years from now. All the other articles you will have ticked off. You will say, yes, I have advanced ruling. Yes. I have a single window. Yes, I have a transit agreement. Yes, I have established pre-arrival processing. Yes, I have a website where customs duties are published and so on. Article 10.1 says we must continuously minimize the incidents, continuously review requirements, continuously reduce the time. It always choose the least trade restrictive measure. And this will still be relevant in 100 years from now because there will be new technologies, new demands on trade and transport. Which leads me back to the energy transition where I'm also very optimistic. We need to establish today the rules for the future technology and, and demand. Climate change, you've heard of it, no? So who is paying today for climate change? People in Bangladesh whose lands are flooded, investors in the Bahamas whose properties are affected by hurricanes, farmers in Mali whose crops fail, families on the Pacific island who disappear, or here in Switzerland, the rich Swiss colleagues who are left without snow. So somebody is already paying. Who should pay? The polluter should pay. The polluter should be given three options. Don't pollute. I mean, that's microeconomics 101. I, I was teaching this as, a, as an assistant when I did my PhD in Hamburg, internalization of externalities. No? So, so the beauty really is that you don't impose a specific solution, but you allow the operator to choose whether to use electric car or not, or to drive or not to drive, or to clean up or not. When there's an oil spill, uh, or before there's an oil spill, you can maybe have double hulled tankers and try as much as you can to avoid it. If still an accident happens, you clean up as fast as possible. And if cleanup is too late, then you have to compensate the fishermen and tourism industries who get lost, who lose. Yeah. Um, so in that context, there are now market-based measures at the International Maritime Organization. They are now called actually economic measures, which is better because a levy is not really a market-based, it's, it's a price, but the good thing is a, a price. So these are measures that place a price on greenhouse gas emissions. Can be a levy. And um, yeah, I very proudly show you a document of the International Maritime Organization published in 1995. Some of you were not born. 
which introduces the internalization of costs, written by a very young, enthusiastic, slim, no gray hair, German JPO who worked in London and was happy that he would save the world. And um, so there we are. And I explained the internalization externalities to people who earn twice as much as I, with much more experiences, who knew much more. And after I explained the internalization of externalities, including what I just showed you before, how there are these three options and so on. And then I overheard how one director, a lawyer, asked another director from some country's Coast Guard, what is Hoffman talking about? All this internationalization of externalities. Now, I'm unfortunately, you're all muted and I can't hear how you're all laughing out loudly, but I find this very funny because it's of course not about internationalizing, it's about internalizing. And it didn't work at that time, but since then, and I don't claim credit for this, there are many developments, but IMO has come a long way. And by now there are many, many, private sector who understand it's actually the way to go. So imagine a levy on CO2. We have the Marshall Islands, we have the Trafigura as a shipper, we have the Internal Chamber of Shipping. Many are now looking at not so much if, but how to introduce this concept. And there are two main advantages here. One is that without this economic measure, the alternative fuels will not become competitive. And the other one that it can actually generate money that can be given to some very good use. No? For us in Anktat, it was very important that some of the poorest and smallest countries, there's a small print at the bottom right, I'm not sure if you can read it, but there you have from Bangladesh to Senegal and St. Lucia, they're very small island states who have understood, although a levy will increase their shipping costs, it's still A, the, the most efficient way, and B, it can generate funds that could also help these countries. How much are we talking about? So this is my back on the envelope. No, it's my in front of the PowerPoint slide little calculation. So I, I looked how many tons of bunker are there. And then one thing you probably know, but for those who don't, if you burn one liter of fuel in your car, one kilo, yeah, one liter, one kilo more or less, you produce three kilos of CO2 because it's one C and two O's. Yeah, CO2 and an O atom is roughly as heavy as a C atom. So C, one C plus two O's is three times as much. So if you then multiply this with 100 ton per emission levy, you reach something like 72 billion or milliarden, mil millones per year of carbon levy. It won't be that much because some of this will be a discount. Some of this will be will be given back, but it's really a lot of money we are talking about. But again, technological progress will never be as slow as today. I'm optimistic it will work. And those who are afraid, who think our ah, costs will go up, last slides are on their way. The decarbonization of maritime transport, delaying the transition is more costly than the transition. So we now move back from the end of transition to the challenges and opportunities. My dear beloved demand and supply curve. You remember, no? I had shown this before. You remember what happened during COVID? What happens if I have a levy? The supply curve will go slightly up. It will have a rather small, depends on the how high it is, but it will have some impact on volumes. What happens if ship owners wait? and if they don't know what to build, what to do. And if we don't have enough ships, ships get older, we don't have the right ships. If the ports in Kiribati and Tuvalu don't have the bunkering stations to offer and the ships have to carry their own fuel four times, up to four times less energy dense, and then they arrive and they have to ask, can I have some ammonia or some hydrogen, or some methanol, or some traditional fuel? Difficult. So it's all this is risky, risky, risky. This can lead to not enough supply and even more increases in costs. 
last three slides, positive opportunities. We think about the developing countries. They can be providers of alternative fuels. There is an opportunity. Zero carbon shipping represents a business and development opportunity for several developing countries. In the past, the bunker fuel market was a very non-inclusive market. Countries with large oil reserve could participate, others could not. Today, this will be more, more open. Of course, you still have to, to invest. But opportunity two, with the generated funding, now, yes, shipping costs will go up. But some of the funding generated with the levy can be invested. Uh, in the review, we have the calculations. Uh, these are within like two standard deviations, whatever. Yeah. You, you improve, you invest in improved port infrastructure. You invest in improved trade facilitation. You improve shipping connectivity. All this helps reduce maritime transport costs. So there's, that's what we think needs to be done to help the poorest countries, the small island states, the least developed countries, who did not cause climate change and will have to pay higher freight costs. So we need to help them invest. But all of us, the maritime industry has the historical opportunity to be ahead of the curve we can shape one global multilateral framework. Other industries need to implement many national frameworks where there is the risk of free riders and no global enforcement. And all this, please join us 21 to 24 May in Barbados. We are organizing a global supply chain forum. It's in person only, I'm sorry. You can't connect on the net. You have to come to Barbados, beautiful beaches. Um, and it's going to be a very interesting conference where we will discuss all these things over four days with parallel streams. Uh, so please join us there too. Here's the, the link, the acknowledgements. Really, this is a teamwork. It's not just Jan Hoffman, it's really a lot of co-authors and data providers and peer reviewers. And, and really, thank you all. And, and here are where you can find us and contact us so far. Did you believe everything I told you? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jan. Um, truly appreciate it. With this, what I thought might work is um, please feel free to ask questions if you've got some time here um, for us. Um, sure. uh, either I think ask we, them what in did the we say room. an hour and a half or so altogether? How, how long did I speak? I spoke almost an hour, no? Wow, you right. are very patient. Thank you for listening that long. What well, man, it was so nice. It was amazing. We are like that. Everybody's like that. No, no but, but, but it's... Um, my Is wife is not, not yet back from the from shopping and gym, so I'm still allowed to be with you here in my home office. Please, um, any any questions or in the chat, or is there, if there's not nothing in the chat yet, maybe you just raise your your hand and ask. I see there's something. Um, I can... have a question. Please. Um, so do you would you say that emerging markets are more at that... At an advantage because there's more opportunity for foreign direct investment as well as government investment for their um, logistic infrastructure as a, compared to developed countries. Um, yeah, and I, when you, especially when you use the term emerging markets, that already sounds positive. Uh, I don't have the graph here at hand, but historically, you really had a big gap between, on the one hand, the industrialized countries. You remember, I had this one chart with the distribution of labor where in 1970, the developing countries were just exporters of raw materials. And now many of them are really participating. So in that sense, there is definitely a, a positive opportunity that many of what you call emerging markets or middle income developing countries, or, but even in some cases, relatively poor countries can benefit any any change is also an opportunity and given climate and geographical location when it comes to being hub ports uh, providers of fuels uh, countries that have identified potential include morocco mexico sri lanka but also chile south africa where where i do see really, really difficult is the small islands that are far out there on the Pacific and, and other oceans, I would not dare call them emerging markets. They, they can, they 
export services, tourism, financial, very little specialized exports. For them, I see far fewer opportunities. So short answer, short question, long, complicated answer. A bit of everything. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, please? I would encourage my students to specifically. There's a question by uh, Michael Amponsa. Ah, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, this question is really about liberalization. And I, I really honestly don't have a view if you want to liberalize or not. Of course, we all have learned our Ricardo and the competitive advantages and, and that trade overall increases global GDP. Um, but I'm not speaking about this. I'm speaking about trade efficiency. And if some country really chooses not to trade, they don't want to trade, that's fine. But then I prefer a tariff or duty or even a quota or a prohibition than make me fill out a stupid paper form or some other non-tariff horrible measure. So, so that's the point here. I, I don't pre have pretexts of, of barriers to trade. If you don't want to trade, say so. So that's my, my answer to this one. But the specific this issue of liberalization, uh, I recommend to read Danny Roderick, who is an economist, trade economist, whose books are overall in line, I think, with a lot of what Ankta trade economists also say. So he gave the, the following example. Um, you liberalize trade, and then you really have, as a result, you have different sectors in the country, some lose, some gain. So let's say you liberalize ag agricultural trade. And so let's say the farmers in your country lose 19 and the uh, city population gains 20. So the country as a whole gains one. And that's correct. So the global GDP, because the other country has the same, the global GDP grows, it's better. Now, psychologically, you all know that losing 19 hurts much more than gaining 20. And the structural change has transition costs. So I am in favor of trading more and opening up trade, but do it carefully and maybe at times slowly with accompanying measures so that those who lose their job are helped to find jobs in the other aspects that then, then grow. So I hope I've answered Michael's question. Thank you. Anybody else, please? Normally, there is more controversy and disagreement about the, the carbon levy. Uh, but I see there are no Greek ship owners among you. Uh, <laughs> Who by now, by the way, many of them have also understood. Uh, it, it's really, nobody likes to pay taxes. But what leads to the increase in costs is not the levy or the tax. It is the higher costs of alternative fuels. That's the underlying thing. Because if you use alternative fuels, you don't pay the levy. You only pay it if you continue using the old fuel. So that was the hypothetical questions you did not ask. But Anyhow. <laughs> I have another question about uh, carbon emissions, uh, because how do you think UNCTAD or the United Nations can force like uh, countries like Saudi Arabia or China to make the transitions to like green fossil fuels? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, th there's the beauty of the global multilateral international maritime organization. I cannot force Saudi Arabia at home to stop burning oil to um, produce the energy to um, have your air conditioning. Yeah, And 
I was twice this year in Saudi Arabia and I was very happy that I had air conditioning. Yeah. And I used it. Yeah. Um, but in shipping, that's a, like the question is about enforcement in, in shipping. The beauty of shipping is that normally ships go to different ports in different countries and you have what we call the port state control. So it is the port state control that actually enforces also the, the IMO conventions for registries for flags that are not enforcing it themselves. Five registries, the biggest now since recently is Liberia, followed by Panama, Marshall Islands, Hong Kong, Singapore. They are the top five. They register half of the world fleet. And they're actually good registries. I, I normally don't use the term flag of convenience. It's an open registry. And if you come to, uh, to Rotterdam, or I, are, you, are you from where are you calling Siemen? <laughs> um, so, so I am from, calling from uh, Hamburg, but from originally Hamburg. I am from the Netherlands. Right, so okay. I know Rotterdam. Right. So be it Hamburg, be it Rotterdam, the ship with the flag of Panama arrives there it is less likely to be inspected than it comes with a flag of, now this is being recorded, isn't it? Well, never mind. <laughs> if it came with another flag from, say, St. Vincent or from uh, Mongolia, or there are some flags who empirically, statistically have less good track record. So there's a motivation for the ship owner and the flag and the classification and the insurance to actually comply. And if there is an IMO rule that says you must pay if you if you burn see if you produce CO2, you pay because otherwise you will be detained in the next port. So that's that's the difference. That's the beauty, the opportunity in maritime transport, which is much more difficult with the national plans. No? Serena raised her hand. Thank you. Hello. Um, so we heard a lot about the, the significant impacts of AI development within this field, but um, have you also like heard any of like controversies or, you know, um, or negative feedback mm -hmm. towards the development? Well, actually, in in exactly one week, no, on Wednesday, in eight days. <laughs> I'm moderating a session here in Geneva at the Anktad E Week, the e commerce week, uh, where for 90 minutes I will discuss your question. But fortunately, I'm only the moderator. I don't have to give the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I will have people there from the Global Alliance for Trade Station, from the WTO, um, from Anktad. I'm still waiting for one more from a shipping line discussing your question. So um, if you want to come to Geneva next week, the registration is free. <laughs> um, one question I'm, I'm asking myself, and you, you had seen the slide I had with all these books. So the more I read about this, the, the less I'm, I'm certain. Huh? So one book uh, I really recommend, I find it impressive, The Coming Wave. So The Coming Wave discusses if this time it is different, because in the past, you may have seen about the, the Luddites or, or people who destroyed the, the machines that produce textile instead of manual textile. I mean, there are all these transitions. Agriculture in Germany, 150 years ago, I forgot the exact numbers. I don't know, 80% of the population was working in agriculture and people were hungry. Today, in the most industrialized countries, between 2 and 6% people work in agriculture and, and food is thrown away. Yeah? So, But it doesn't mean that the other 75% or so are unemployed. No, they work as, as nurses, as drivers, as artists, as, as teachers. So I am overall optimistic, positive that the jobs that are killed with the new technologies will be the, the time that we all gain can be used for other more meaningful things, art, services, and so on. But I'm not sure. I mean, this book, The, the Coming Wave, is expressing doubts whether it will work again, this transition. 
thank you. I appreciate the recommendation. I'll look into it. Thank, thank you. Absolutely. Anybody else, please? Okay. If there's no one else, I'm looking at the at the chat as well. If there's no one else, um, there again. Uh, I'll ask another question, Professor. Oh, Sorry for super. The interruption. Juliana, thank you, Juliana. Um, could you maybe go into more depth on some of the capacity building programs you mentioned earlier? I think you mentioned it, they took place in Caribbean, Latin America, and Asia. Mm. So. Yeah, so what do we do at ANCTA to help countries in, in our area? Um, different programs. Let me start, for example, the one that meeting we had uh, where Lourdes also joined us in Las Palmas. We have a port, we have trained for trade port management network. There we have ports that become members. They actually have to pay something, not too much, but there you have a win, 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 win. <laughs> so the ports do a do modules, training, it's for middle managers. It's not university level, but it's really, but it's quite practical where we transmit how are the IMO conventions working, what is port marketing, some IT things. And then the people who are trained, they may then next year go to another country's port and teach there. So it's really, we call it South-South cooperation. It sounds maybe a bit condescending but it's so there you have some partner ports we have partner ports at this moment in ireland in france in spain who also send experts some of the teaching is done by us so my salary is paid by your taxes thank you very much so it's really a, a combination of donor funding from the countries in-kind contributions south south and un and it's i love that program it's really very very good. The, the people become friends, they help each other, they, work, help, they, they network. And in the same program, we have since recently also started to generate KPIs. So the ports trust us that if they send us statistics, we will not publish them, but we will give them back compared to the other ports who shared, okay, you port anonymized, you stand here compared to the average of your peers in terms of moves per hour, moves per ki kilometer, wh whatever, no? some KPIs. So that's one program we have. Another program uh, is on trade facilitation where um, we work with donor funding. So at this moment we have the World Bank, we have United Kingdom, we used to have Spain also, we have some money from Germany at present. So the developed countries and partners and African Development Bank also, um, they give us money to help countries understand and implement their obligations under the WTO. So they have all agreed and signed up. But the part of the deal at the WTO here in Geneva was that the rich countries promised the poorer countries, who also committed, who promised, they signed, yes, I will implement those 37 measures. You know, the, some of them I mentioned, you know, the transit and the advanced ruling and the separation of release and clearance, a lot of these customs. So we help them then to understand and implement this. And uh, not in my branch, but another branch, uh, it can actually be a software. We have a software called Asicuda, which is used in 100 countries in the world. So it's actually a thing that then automates customs. And if you automate customs, uh, it reduces corruption because it's the computer who decides and not the human who negotiates with you. you know? And it makes things much simpler. And we have found wherever we introduce this automation, actually the revenue of the country increases because it's more transparent and clearer and you avoid yeah, unethical behavior. No? So these are our three examples. We have in, in maritime transport, we, we also work on corridors. We work on um, a lot of assessment. Uh, we give legal, we have two lawyers who may help with uh, they participate in meetings of ANSITRAL to advise countries and, and organizations what needs to be changed in your national law so that the evil of lading can work. So I'm just 
thinking aloud. I, I had some initial slides at the beginning where with some examples. I I will put in the chat before uh, we end uh, a link to which is not there to, to my branch where you can see all these programs. Let me put this in the chat while while we may have time for one or two more questions, unless you believe everything I told you. Um, then if, I'll ask one more question. What advice would you give to students who are looking to enter a career in international trade and logistics or just international trade? Um, yeah, it's um, objectively, not just because I love my job, but logistics, trade, transport is a job that works um, only if you collaborate, if you work together. So it, the, the, when you go to port conferences, you see they very few ports compete. Yes, Rotterdam and Hamburg do compete a little bit for the hinterland, but most ports in the world work together. So I think it's, if you like collaboration and working together, I think it's overall positive. Customs officers, okay, they may be a bit suspicious people always think the way, but when you work with other customs, it's, it's collaboration. Um, that's one line of thought. Um, I also like to recommend an art a paper or a blog post by David Brooks from the New York Times, which is called, It's Not About You. So that one you have to Google. It's not about you, David Brooks, which basically says uh, you don't, you cannot find yourself, you create yourself. <laughs> and in our business, which is so lively and moving and fascinating, you continuously create yourself. Uh, and what you study is should above all be tools. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you learn the elasticity and, and numbers and how many tons of cargoes. No, but you learn learn tools. And when I did my PhD and, and before, I was really lucky that one of my professors, when I asked him, what do I study when I go one year to Spain? So I studied one in Barcelona and he said, do econometrics because that is useful everywhere, where, whereas some other things are only useful in your own country. Uh, and as you asked, uh, I mentioned earlier, one of my sons did his master's in artificial intelligence. The other one is working in London on big data. He does, does maps and 3D and with big data. And the oldest one works for Canadian think tank on climate change adaptation. So these are three things that did not exist when Lourdes and William and I went to university. <laughs> yeah. AI, climate change, and, and really big data. So what will you work on in 30 years from now? We don't know. <laughs> so all recommendations, the field you're working in transport, it's, it's great. I would focus on tools, not so much on facts. Be open-minded and uh, be aware that things will change. Thank you so much, that was very insightful. Was it was indeed. Anybody else? Okay. Well, we're right. We're right a little bit. We went just a little bit over, but that's mm. wonderful. Um, once again, uh, thank you, Jan, for no, no. for being with us again this year. It's the two years in a 